Well, I went to school in the United States, um, and it was a very traditional, you know, education. Uh, more teacher-centered than student-centered. Um, so it, it's quite a bit different. I mean, even though today we have a lot of, like, curriculum requirements and that kind of thing, uh, I think there is, you know, it's more, it is more student-centered in, in a lot of ways, and there's more recognition of particularly trying to deal with individual differences for children, right? And I, I think that would be the major difference. Whereas before, you fit into the system and that was it. There was no, uh, there was nothing, I, I mean, I don't think they even had anything like special education or anything like that. So I, I think that would be the big difference, yeah. The holistic education as a term only came in in the mid 80s. Before, the, the word that was used probably most frequently was humanistic education or to progressive education maybe. Um, and the, the main reason that I feel that holistic education, um, you know, has, is needed is that the, the, the problem with, again, traditional education is just too fragmented. It, like what I said last night, it breaks, it breaks knowledge down into courses and then the uh, uh, un uh, units and then lessons and then little bits of information and so the student going through has all of this like unconnected information that they can't really like make sense of and holistic education is really designed so that students can see relationships that they are in relationships that the that the uh, the earth itself is a set of, of relationships and uh, that that is, you know, one of the major things. The other major thing about holistic education it tries to educate the whole whole child. And it's, you know, Gandhi said that um, the, the the person is is consists of the head, hands, and the heart. And if we just focus on the head, and 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 that they constitute an indivisible whole, you really can't separate them out. If you set them, separate them out, he said you commit a gross fallacy. And, and again, unfortunately, I think a lot of our education is committed to gross fallacy and basically focused on the head. So holistic education is really trying to address that, that concern. Yeah. You would have individual teachers where you felt like some kind of connection, right? It wasn't, and again, it wasn't their particular teaching methodology, and that gave you some sense of what was really important in education was to feel the connection with, with the teacher, right? That they actually cared for you as a human being. And, uh, I mean, again, that's a really important part of holistic education. So I, certainly not in any of the teaching techniques that teachers use, because, again, they were very traditional, but you, you did have an occasional teacher where you felt that they were concerned for you as a human being and not just as a student sitting in the classroom, right? So that would be, I think. The other um, is that, in the, again, as a young adult, I got very interested in humanistic psychology. That was the work of like Carl Rogers and Abraham Maslow. They wrote material about the, uh, what was called uh, the human potential movement that, again, that they're, that they're really, the human being really uh, is basically good. And it, it was called the third force in psychology because basically then you had behaviorism and Freudian psychology, which were very kind of negative views of the human being in a lot of ways. So they presented a view of the human being as, as uh, Abe Maslow talked about, we can, we can have self-actualization, we can develop a whole human being. Uh, Rogers used the, the term fully functioning person, but again, it's an image of the whole person, and they just use different language, right? So that image was used then in, in humanistic education as a goal to develop self-actualized children or self-actualized adults or fully functioning. Uh, so those, those people had a big influence on me as a young, when I was like starting as a teacher, starting my, my graduate work, the, those were big influences on me. You know, 
I would say like 40%, right? Because <laughs> we're still leaving out, the, I mean, there is maybe 50% because there is acknowledgement of, of physical activity. So in, in Ontario, they're supposed to do a daily physical activity every day for like, I think 30 minutes or at least 30 minutes. So there is an acknowledgement, but that's only 30 minutes, right? The rest of the day, it's basically the head. So, and there's very little focus on the social, emotional, or the nothing on the spiritual, right? So, um, I, I would say somewhere around 40, maybe 50 percent that you know that we have today. If you look at systems like Montessori and Waldorf, and there are many other like humanist or holistic systems, Krishnamurti's work, uh, Quaker schools. There are many alternative schools around the world that are very, I mean, their vision is the whole person. And I think they, I don't think anybody can come 100%, right? But I think they get to 80, 90. Certainly in their vision, it's 100%. It's how, how it's actualized. I mean, that varies a lot from school to school and teacher to teacher, right? So, but I, you know, my, I mean, I've had a long connection with Waldorf and, and, um, Certainly, you know, they, they, they really strive hard to bring all three together, yeah. I think it's hard for new teachers, and, and I think they, they have to find a comfort level uh, of what they can do holistically within the system, right? They can't... Uh, it, the system is too like it's too uh, laid out in terms of what they're supposed to do, but I still think there is room to do some holistic. And and the main thing again, what I talked about last night is the teacher presence, right? Again, you can even in a very traditional like educational setting, if the teacher can be present and show caring to the students, um, you can have. Uh, an important aspect of holistic education because again if that student feels in their classroom that the teacher actually cares about them as a human being and I think any teacher no matter what the curriculum is they can show that in different ways by showing interest in what the students do after school maybe even attending the sports events that they're involved in I mean there's a lot of different ways outside the curriculum that they and Nell Noddings has done a lot of work on caring uh, she wrote a book called Learning to Care, the different kinds of ways that you can bring caring into an educational setting. So um, it, it is possible, right? So um, I think in, in working in that way, they, they, can, they can bring aspects of it into the classroom. Well, I think the similarity is just what I've talked about with the teacher. I mean, the, the parent, um, obviously has to show love for their child uh, and I think that's even stronger than, than the teacher that so and again being present listening to children um, obviously the difference is is that the teacher has to have a program for the for, you know and, and I, I think for the parent I you know we hear so much about kids being over over programmed right and they talk about the bubble child that's just so like their whole life is like in this bubble created by the parent right and so like what I said last night is as much as possible give the child some freedom I mean this is the opposite of all you know you hear about the tiger mother now like <laughs> and uh, I just don't agree with that I, I think you need to have expectations for your children that they behave in an appropriate way and that uh, they have some, they develop, you know, uh, some sense of responsibility. Those things, you know, you need as a parent to, to do. So that is somewhat similar as to, you know, teacher has expectations. But you, you give the child a much greater sense of freedom as a parent than you do as a, I mean, the, the student is in the classroom, that's, the, there are very specific boundaries, but as a parent, I mean, you, 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 you have a lot of choices of what, how much freedom you're going to give your child, right? Most parents are concerned about the happiness of their kids, right? And if they end up, you know, being just so focused on their kids' performance and grades, 
again, I think it's, I think, again, parents should have expectations that their kids do well in school as well as they're capable of doing, but not to the point where they get stressed out or uh, if they don't, um, you know, do well in a particular course or whatever that, you know, uh, that uh, they start experiencing a lot of stress. So um, I, I think we need to focus on what ultimately, again, is going to make their child, uh, you know, a happy human being.